real quickly, quickly why I'm here. Um, I grew up in a small town in South Carolina. I didn't have biology in high school. Um, so I had no idea that I ever wanted to go to med school or be a doctor. It was like the last thing in my mind. And uh, I was lucky enough that I, I did have someone who taught me CPR one day. Uh, we had someone come to school who did CPR. And I had a friend in college who's my age, uh, I guess a couple years ago my age, uh, who had a heart attack while we were playing soccer uh, in the field. And uh, we did CPR on him from the hospital, and uh, he actually survived, which was good. But it really kind of got me thinking, you know, like, why did my friend, he's so young, have a heart attack? And uh, he had a problem with his heart. It was a genetic defect. And uh, I started down this pathway and ended up going to medical school, which is a pretty big jump from not taking biology in high school. So I'd like to be able to kind of help you guys out and give you some exposure to the field as well as teach you how your bodies work. Um, so we have any questions about med school or anything before we start? Go. Because you can take biology. Yeah, so I had to I had to go to a program. I'd actually it was my last year of college, so I had to go to a program just for people who didn't know they were going to med school. And then I took uh, biology for the first time with a bunch of people who had had it since like high school. So it was fascinating for me. I was like, oh my god, we're made of cells. But I was also dumber than everyone else in the class because they had already done this for like five years. So good. Come on. Where'd you go to school? Uh, sorry, I went to uh, undergrad at University of Texas at Austin. Mm. Uh, anyone? Uh, Ohio. Pardon? Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, I went to, uh, I did my post-baccalaureate, which was my, I didn't know I wanted to go to med school year at uh, Harvard. Uh, I went to graduate school at the University of South Carolina uh, with a master's in neuroscience and uh, neuroradiology. And then finally went to med school uh, here at Case. I'm third year. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. So there's me. That's what we're doing. Uh, all right. So ten man, the heart. Uh, basically, we're really gross, high maintenance structures walking around. It's sad to think about, but we really are really high maintenance. And if you think about it, what happens when the heart stops? Basically, it yeah. dies. Right. Uh, so we're kind of teetering on the brink of this tenuous, you know, survival. Uh, we have these ins and outs where we breathe in constantly. Try to hold your breath for like two minutes. Okay. It just takes for it's it's you start going crazy. We are Everybody teetering on the brink of, of controlling these ins and outs. So we need oxygen for cellular metabolism. We need water all the time. You can go two or three days without water. Food and eh, two weeks. Water you gotta have. Oxygen you gotta have by the minute. Uh, source of energy, we've got to have food we take in, you guys know this stuff. Uh, and the building blocks, we've got to build up our body because we're constantly breaking stuff down. Um, we got a lot of waste products. Uh, you know, we have bathrooms on every floor of every building in the world because we're gross creatures that are constantly turning over stuff. We're taking stuff in, putting it back out. So we've got to get rid of CO2, which we breathe out constantly, try to hold your breath, it feels terrible, and then break down products with a nice word to say poop in your hand. So uh, the problem with all this is we're modular creatures. We've got our heart here, lungs here, the kidneys are way back here, and then we've got stupid muscles in the foot that have to get oxygen, they have to get rid of their CO2, they need food, so we eat food, it goes in the gut, we gotta get it, the nutrients down to the feet, we gotta get it up to the brain, it's a huge pain. So this is basically the reason the circulatory system exists. Is because we started as, as creatures got larger and larger, you had to start pumping stuff forcefully out and trying to perfuse these far out cells. Um, so as I said, if it stops, you see how quickly, how important the heart is. All you need is a few minutes for stopping, and you're in deep, deep trouble. Um, so any questions so far? Okay. Um, so <laughs> the greatest equation ever in the history of equations is this Ohm's law. You can use it for biology, chemistry, physics, anything. Physics. Uh, <laughs> is probably the best place to use it. Uh, so V equals IR. Um, do you guys know electricity yet? We yeah, just did it. Only now. Okay. So they, uh, so Ohm's Law is of course very relevant right now. Um, so uh, did they describe, or did, did uh, not to put anyone on the spot, but did they describe electricity kind of a flow of water? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a good analogy in case you don't understand electricity because it confused me the first time. Uh, if you think about voltage, it's basically, if you think about uh, electricity as water that you're damming up, um, the voltage is basically the pressure. Your I, which is your flow, 
is how quickly it's flowing, and R is your resistance. So R is resistance, you put up a big dam, stops up, the pressure builds up. I is flow, you have a lot of flow and you dam it up, pressure builds up. Go for it. Oh, my bad. Oh, that's right. Um, so the same thing happens with your, with your arteries and the, the way that blood flows. Um, you have a higher pressure, your flow is going to be faster with the same resistance. Everyone on board so far? Mm -hmm. Basic stuff. Okay. Um, so we got arteries and veins. You guys already learned the structure of the heart. Arteries going away. Veins bringing blood back. Um, arteries are extremely high pressure. When you take your pulse, you're obviously feeling an artery. And more blood pressure is like, anyone? Anyone know watch like medical TV? 120 over 8. Yeah, 120 over 8. Uh, venous pressure is like 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. So you can so you pump away from the heart in this high pressure system through these really muscular arteries. You go through the capillary beds and come back towards the venous system, and it's really really low pressure. And if you ever watch like bad TV, like Grey's Anatomy or something like that, when someone gets like a bad cut and it's an artery, it's like spurting all over the room. And it's like great TV and very exciting. When someone nicks a vein, like if you ever gotten an IV or like a, someone's giving you a shot, he doesn't spray across the room. He just kind of like leads it out slowly. It's not very exciting. It looks good unless you're, so your blood's coming out of you. Yeah. Um, when do arteries turn into veins? Like at what point? So, I don't know the picture of it. But basically, so your arteries are all going out, and they go further and further out, right? And they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, they literally get so small that they're what we call capillaries, where there's, they're so small that only one blood cell can fit through at a time. And so all these blood cells are funneling through, and they finally get to this really, really, really tiny artery, and your resistance is going up and up because your tubes are getting smaller, right? So as they get down there, one red blood cell can actually just wiggle through that one little capillary, and then it turns back into a vein and starts draining everything back away. Because you know, once you've gotten all the way out to the, the farthest spot, there's nowhere else to go, and you've got ways to get rid of. All right? And it's actually kind of interesting. Um, that's the reason people who have sickle cell have a problem, is because this one little tiny capillary is so small that uh, red blood cells, you guys ever seen a picture of red blood cell? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a, if you bit a donut like this. So what it does is it gets down in that capillary where it only fits one red blood cell and it wiggles its way through. It's pretty tight. Um, but if you have a sickle cell that's literally shaped like a sickle, it can't fold up nice and happily and swing through there, so it gets caught. And when it gets caught, that builds up. There's no blood flow going past that and it hurts a lot. So that's what people have with sickle cell get sickle pricey. They get a lot of pain a lot, uh, especially further out. They don't say, you know, oh, my, you know, my chest is right here. It's in the fingers. It's far out where these vessels get smaller and smaller and smaller. Good? Okay. So, veins, I said IVs. Why do you put an, uh, an IV line, intravenous line? Why did the doctors obviously put that in your vein? Yeah, so it pulls it back to the heart. And as soon as you get back to the heart, go back through an artery and go everywhere. So the drug just doesn't go, you know. If you put it in an artery right here, it would just go to the end of the hand. And then it'd have to slowly drain back in. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> uh, Alright, so why are arteries awesome? Arteries are awesome, by the way. Don't argue with me on this. Okay. They really are fantastic. Um, the cool thing about arteries is this is how you control where your blood goes. So for example, don't swim after eating is something people always say. It's not true, by the way. You can swim after eating. It's not a big deal. <laughs> but the reason they say that is some physiologist way back when thought that, uh, well, he knew that when you eat, you're usually sitting down and relax, right? Mm -hmm. At least optimally. Um, you start eating a food, all, all this food, you don't need to perfuse you know, all the muscles in your hands really well or your, your arms and legs. You're sitting down, you're just kind of. So you're going to need to perfuse your gut because that's going to pick up all these nutrients and send them all over your body. And that's the most important thing at the time. So what you do is you clamp off all these arteries in your legs and arms and you perfuse your gut a lot more than you normally do. Shoot. Do you know what um, perfusion means? Yeah, good question. You can know if you can still mm -hmm. know. Using. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have a good Latin root to it that I know. But uh, perfusing is getting blood to an area. So if I if I cut off an artery like this in my hand, and my hand starts dying like it is right now, and it really hurts, um, there's no perfusion going into this hand. There's no blood flow. As soon as you let go, reperfuse. Make sense? Do you guys don't know a word yet? Say something. Yes. <laughs> all right, so uh, the reason people said don't swim after eating is because they thought all your blood would be in your gut, and if you started swimming, you would get a cramp and drown. But you do get a cramp. People, it's one of those things where people think they get more cramps after eating. 
but I, I promise you, the studies show that people don't. Um, the really good case is if you have a broken artery. And by broken artery, you usually mean a big cut or someone you know, does something really stupid to you and like breaks a bone in you and you lacerate the artery. The last thing your body wants to do is shoot blood through this artery that's cut in two. You're going to lose all your blood. And arteries are really high pressure, right? So it's going to be like Grey's Anatomy shooting all across the walls. It's really exciting. Unless it's your blood when it's terrifying. So that artery clamps itself off. It says, let's not lose all our blood. Clamps itself off. So it's great for emergency. And not perfusing some organs is downright stupid. So no matter what you're doing, you need your brain. And I'm not just saying that because I want to go to neurosurgery. Brains are super important. If you're eating, you need your brain so you don't choke. Because unfortunately, our windpipe and our food pipe are right next to each other. If you're running away from a tiger, you really need your brain. <laughs> you got to get out of it pretty quick. Um, so at the first sniff of trouble, and by that I mean uh, if you, you need to run, run away from something, something scary, you lose a lot of blood, anything happens at all. A great example is hypothermia. What happens when you get cold outside? You start getting goosebumps. So you get really cold. So what, if you ever felt your chest when you're cold? No. Or your, it's your carpets? It's warm. It's warm yeah. Why is your chest warm? Because it's under your clothes. No, it has it's your heart. not. Your heart. Your it's because it has your heart and your lungs and your kidneys and all your important stuff in here. Why is your heart? Uh, just because they're right next to the chest. Mm. Um, don't, don't sniff those empty products. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where all your important organs are. If you don't give them blood flow, they're going to be in trouble, right? Because they need oxygen, they're making waste and stuff like that. If you're cold and your body thinks you're, it's going to be cold for a while and you're in trouble, you don't need a hand nearly as much as you need a heart, right? right? So you shunt off all your warm blood. So your hands get freezing. That's why your hands are so cold when you go outside. And you provide perfusion to all these organs that will die if they don't get blood. So if everything's working up here, like, and that's why we're not cold and they connect to each other, how come we are cold? So the arteries leading, so like there's an artery, the off the aorta, the subclavian, goes into the arm right here. And so the subclavian actually clamps itself down. So it, it, it increases its resistance huge, huge, like 10 times, 20 times more. And so all the blood, uh, just like, um, whatchamacallit, flowing downhill and having an obstacle, you always go around high resistance, right? You always want to go for the least resistance. So instead of going through here, it'll go through all these other, it'll go through the rest of your aorta and perfuse the rest of these organs to prevent warming up this arm when it needs to warm up the heart, the kidneys, the lungs, the liver. Oh. Good? Yeah. Okay, so why is it like in the summer, like your hands and your feet will still be cold? Mm. If that's okay. Different mechanism for the question. Um, so what happens when you, uh, if it's room temperature and someone throws water on you, you get really cold, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that we regulate our heat is we sweat, make ourselves wet, and then when the water evaporates, it takes heat with it. Just like uh, boiling water, steam comes off, and it, uh, it takes a bunch of heat. Basically the same concept. We put water all over ourselves, it comes off, and it takes heat with it. You're making a, I don't like that face. Oh. That's fine. Uh, you want me to say it a different way? Yes. Um, so, let's see. Because <laughs> um, like, I could just be sitting there and then my hands and my feet would just be really cold. Well, that's my answer will do. But I think it <laughs> I mean, depends on the person, doesn't it? Yeah, it would depend on uh, someone's circulation. And, you know, my hands are always cold, which people love because I touch people's bellies all day. It's freezing. Um, but uh, from a sense of, like, regulating hot and cold, you use sweat to cool yourself off and then blood to keep yourself warm. So it's just you, Yeah, it's just you. I was ready to nice. You're good. Right. So, um, yeah. what does your body do? Say it's cold outside and you're like running, and then your limbs need oxygen. So, we'll go, we'll go through. You start shutting your muscles, okay. but because they need blood to, they need oxygen basically, is the problem. Okay, so, if a person's anemic, they don't have blood. Do they have to like the whole thing go, uh, like, what is it running? They get cut and they bleed out. That, they will, a lot of, I mean, all these things will shut down or something. What, what do uh, anemic have to do with like, the blood? So, uh, so the blood uses red blood, the red blood cells carry oxygen, right? Yeah. Uh, anemia, by definition, uh, is just not having enough red blood cells, basically. Instead of really iron, it's really red blood cells. And so, you have this fluid in your body, blood is rolling all around, and a lot of it is red blood cells, but a lot of it is just kind of water. 
we're made up of a lot of water. And uh, we 